Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are going to get started again with Dr. Simon Gabois. He is an ethologist and behavioral neuroscience from, neuroscientist from Dalhousie University in Canada. He completed his PhD at the Canadian Centre for Wolf Research in Nova Scotia, Canada, where he studied social behaviour in wolves and its hormonal correlates. His research team currently focuses on wild canids and applied olfactory processing, such as tracking dogs used to monitor species at risk and other wildlife. His work has been featured in numerous documentaries, and as you might imagine, he is a frequent uh, guest speaker on canines. I am incredibly excited because today he is discussing applied canine olfactory processing, what trainers need to know beyond learning theory. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Simon Gabois. Hello again. Uh, you've noticed probably uh, because it's, it's, uh, we're approaching the end, there's a lot of social grooming going on, so people are thanking each other, congratulating each other, etc. I just want to, uh, I won't cover everybody, but I want to uh, thank very much the technical staff that uh, has been great uh, to work with, uh, being very patient with us. I'll let the others do so, some more of that. So. Uh, on Friday, I had my uh, ethologist uh, hat on. Uh, yesterday, my neuroscientist hat on. And today, it's going to be mostly my experimental psychologist hat on. But in a way, I always have the three hats on. But OK, if you're just looking for uh, roughly what kind of perspective I'm going to take on things, uh, today, without a doubt, is uh, more about uh, some aspects of experimental psychology, mostly animal learning, which, by the way, I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself a, a specialist in the area. But psychophysics, yes. And uh, when you do animal psychophysics, which is basically the study of sensation and sensory processing in animals, you have to use operant and sometimes uh, classical conditioning um, procedures to, uh, uh, to figure out really what's going on. And uh, mentioning this, another person I want to, uh, to acknowledge, actually, because I forgot to do so on the slides, is Dr. Vincent Lolordo at Dalhousie University. He's been an amazing uh, uh, individual uh, classical conditioning specialist, uh, very well known, actually. And he's helped uh, my lab over the years quite a lot trying to figure out what the hell is going on with dogs sometimes. And even he doesn't really understand it because, you know, he's done a career working mostly with pigeons and rats, the, the main model in, uh, in animal learning. Uh, and uh, sometimes he shakes his head when we tell him about dog stuff going on in the lab. He's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, so uh, interestingly, clearly, sometimes they break the rules that uh, you know, we thought we had figured out uh, over the years with, with rats and pigeons. Uh, while I'm actually thanking people, I want to talk, uh, thank all of my, uh, my students, volunteers, and mostly the dogs in my lab, because we are, the dogs in the lab and the ones we use in the field as well, uh, we consider that they are uh, research assistants, and, uh, which is a, a nice way to say that they, they help us figure out stuff, and they, uh, they are more than just a tool. I hate that when people say, uh, yeah, the tool you're using, that's not a tool, it's, it's a dog. It's a dog that you know, we have a relationship and a bond with, and, and that's what we do it with dogs and not rats or uh, other animals. But that topic will come back later, as you will see. Okay, so um, by the way, uh, I made a comment yesterday that I will clarify here. Uh, the thing is that you, know, you can't improvise knowledge in something that may sound as simple as training sniffer dogs. And I will clarify what I meant by this yesterday. Uh, and like I said, the problem with working with scent is that you're dealing with something that is intangible, that is invisible. And a lot of people that uh, get into this work uh, assume that that's not really a problem. But remember, we are very much a visual species. And this is why we work with dogs, because we think the human dog team, especially when we do wildlife tracking and trailing, is the best possible because you have the visual animal, that's us, uh, you know, higher from the ground, looking for stuff like snakes, for instance, as you will see later. And then you have like the, the quadruped next to you with a fantastic nose closer to the ground. It's the best team ever that you can imagine. And that's really why that, that works. 
So um, dogs are there to help us with these kinds of things, try to understand this chemical world around us, these molecules that we sometimes detect and sometimes don't. But the thing, though, is that if you really want to do this kind of work, you're fooling yourself if you think that you can't, that you can avoid getting into some kind of obscure areas, actually, of science, and it's all over the place, and I'm still struggling with some of them, by the way. Uh, fluid dynamics is one of them. By fluid, by the way, in physics, chemistry, we really talk about fluid meaning air, but also water. It's not just, uh, you know, liquids. Uh, air is a, is a fluid. Uh, psychophysics, obviously, we'll talk about some of that today. Uh, microclimatology and micrometeorology, especially at the ground level, all right? Because sometimes we don't realize, for instance, that it may be like, I don't know, like cool at 12 degrees. Oh, sorry, I will use uh, Celsius here. I have no idea what's it's in Fahrenheit. Uh, so 12 degrees Celsius, which is kind of a fall day in Canada. Um, and, uh, but at the ground level, because of the sun, uh, in the moss, it's, uh, it's at 25, 27 degrees, which is what, around 80, maybe? I don't know. Um, hot, warm, anyway, much warmer than you would actually expect. So basically, the, the temperature you're experiencing at this level is quite different from the one at ground level, but that influences scent in a major way, okay, among many other things. And obviously, some knowledge in analytical chemistry, actually, another person that's helping us at Dallas University is Dr. Wenzel. He's an analytical chemist and helps us understand all the stuff that Catherine and I, my student, forgot many, many years ago, or forgot recently from many years ago. Okay, look, as you know, I've worked with canids, and uh, we started actually the scent processing uh, work in 2006, roughly. So it is relatively recent, and what we started with actually was a project with what we call forensic canines, and there's many different kind of applications here, um, and I will get back to that in a minute. And more recently, uh, in fact, probably our most successful program has been the conservation in wildlife canines, looking for species at risk, mostly reptiles, as you will see, uh, but also the work, uh, helping us with the work uh, with coyotes in Cape Breton. Um, since uh, we have a, a conservative right-wing government in Canada now, and they're shutting down everything in terms of funding that has to do with research uh, and conservation in the environment, so if you do research in conservation and environment like I used to, uh, you're, you're out of luck. Uh, we, we don't have actually any funding left for this anymore, unfortunately. Uh, we've turned to uh, invasive forest uh, insects like the emerald ash borer, uh, the brown spruce longhorn beetle, which is a real problem in Nova Scotia, uh, gypsy moth, etc. So detection of basically invasive species that really damage North American forests. And we, uh, we have funding there, and it obviously there's a maybe economic uh, uh, impact, but certainly an environmental one as well. And as you will see uh, in more detail to, uh, later today with Catherine, uh, Catherine Reeve, my PhD student, we are uh, doing a little bit of biomedical stuff. Uh, hypoglycemia detection in youth with type 1 diabetes is one of them. And uh, she will tell you about some of the challenges of that research. The problem with a lot of the sniffer dog literature, it can be cancer dogs, you know, cancer detection dogs, or uh, the police work with, with tracking dogs, is that there's a lot of debate out there about is this junk science or not? And trying to figure out why people say this is not always easy. But one of the things that we, we know is that, first of all, there's been some pretty bad science done on this kind of stuff over the years. But also, there's kind of a disconnect between the, what the practitioners do uh, and, and what the science uh, would, would like uh, things, how, how science would like things to be done. And also, the most amazing thing is most of the time when people come to me and say, these guys don't know what they're doing, it's actually dog trainers. They say, this group, uh, in that state, they, they're completely wrong. They, they're using wrong methodologies. They don't have control groups, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not necessarily the scientists that are saying there's something not going on here, by the way. So that's not what I meant yesterday. It's actually uh, uh, dog trainers and dog handlers criticizing each other, and, and often based on, uh, on good science, but you know, again, not always. So is the science really bad? Well, maybe that's part of it. But there's also an issue with how it's done uh, in the field, the practitioners. Okay, so clearly we need more uh, uh, empirical work in this. We need to talk about things like, you know, uh, we do talk about this stuff in science quite a bit, things like validity and reliability and accuracy. And accuracy can be defined at least the way we do it often in psychophysics in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And then we get into mat mathematical models like signal detection theory, all that kind of stuff. Great stuff, but it's not just for anybody. 
Uh, it takes my honor students, for instance, quite a while to understand signal detection theory. But when you understand it, you realize how great tool it is to really understand what the dog is actually doing, uh, and also the nature of the stimulus as well. So in a way, uh, in terms of standardizing things for this kind of work, especially the forensic canines, Europeans are actually ahead of us here. Uh, especially the Dutch group, uh, Schoon, Schoon and Hack. Some of you may actually know that book uh, on, on, uh, uh, on this kind of work. The German, uh, the Poles, etc., are actually doing quite well here. And here in North America, we talk a lot about it, but there's nothing unified yet and no real consensus on how it should be done. But people talk about it, which is a good sign. Eventually, we'll get there. So, um, like I said earlier, I think what you need to get into this uh, world of applied uh, uh, work with sniffer dogs is know about animal learning principles, and, and a lot of you are there already, most of you, in fact, and that's great. Uh, but behind this, there's another kind of very important theoretical uh, background that you need to really understand, and it's psychophysics. And that gets a little bit more complicated. There's a number of mathematical models there, uh, and you really have to understand the sensory stimuli that you work with. So with olfaction, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's, nor it's chemical, essentially, okay? It's molecules, uh, and it's, uh, for that reason, has its own uh, little challenge. But like I said before, you need a few other things as well, and I won't repeat this again, but you get the idea that uh, you need to know about uh, uh, other things going on. Now, this is just a comment. Uh, in relation to how people often think about the work of sniffer dogs the wrong way. Uh, they either say, nah, they can't do it, or they tend to have the exact opposite attitude, which is sure they will. Well, it's really not that simple. Like usual, it's not black or white, and it's in the shades of gray. We've had great success with some of our sniffer dog programs and mm, close to failures uh, with others. So they're not good at everything. And also, we tend to forget the conditions and the context, right? So, you know, you would not go do bird watching at night, or even actually, uh, well, unless you're looking for owls, obviously, uh, uh, in, in thick fog. And there are a number of reasons why. First of all, the visual conditions are not so good. But I see sometimes people do uh, this kind of work with dogs that seem to expect that their dog is actually going to perform at minus 30 uh, Celsius, which is apparently minus 22, that I remember doing that, um, at 10% humidity, pretty dry, thank you, in high wind. <laughs> you know what? The olfactory system basically shuts down in those conditions, even in wolves, okay? They really have a hard time finding their lunch in those kinds of conditions. So it's not because they're well-trained that they can actually thrive in those conditions. Obviously, they don't. So we have to keep this in mind. Okay. Why use dogs? And actually, this is an interesting question because I will actually challenge the idea that dogs are the perfect tool here. Oh, I said tool, sorry. The perfect research assistants. Maybe not. Uh, okay, why? Well, first of all, they have that thing that we call the nose, an olfactory system I'll talk about later. That's the primary reason, obviously. Uh, and I, I go through this with engineers sometimes and people in the biomedical field because they really, engineers for mind detection, for instance, uh, or people in medical diagnosis, they really like their machines and technology. And they really are resistant to this idea that maybe a biological system can be better than the technology. Think about some of the, the scent detection or cancer detection work with dogs, actually, where they are clearly better than any diagnosis tool out there. If I ever get tested for my prostate, I want a dog, not any of the other diagnostic tools that currently <laughs> exist. Okay. So I show them this, and they kind of laugh, <laughs> but really they don't kind of fully get it. So they have also a system that allows you to tell them what to do and help them uh, do their work. It's quite remarkable if you think about this. And uh, they also have a way to tell you if they feel good or not, if they're quote-unquote calibrated that day, or if you actually need to maybe give them a little bit of a rest. Uh, and I know this is starting to sound like real science fiction, but it's also a mobile unit. They move around by themselves. You don't have to carry them. And uh, they can hear commands, right? Uh, so they see, they hear commands. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. And this is why we can use dogs. And there's something really interesting about this is that every 10 or 20 years here in the US, uh, not so much in Canada, but sometimes in Europe or even Israel, actually, uh, I'm thinking of Robert Lubau here, uh, they will actually re-question this. And then they come up with those huge projects. Let's try to see what's going on with dogs, if they're really good at this. And this is actually a study from 1985 uh, from the US Army. 
uh, where they actually, the conclusion of the report after spending a few million dollars on this is this. The dog is a mine detection system which is capable of operating in a vast expanse of climatic and topographical environment. It is a highly adaptable, high sensitivity, high specific detection system which is relatively inexpensive, reasonably durable, readily reproducible, and immediately available. <laughs> wow, a few million dollars later. But we kind of already knew this anyway. But they're doing this again, and they will probably do it in another 20 years. So I don't know why we're so resistant to this idea that they can actually do the job. Now, like I said, I will challenge part of this later towards the end of the talk. So first of all, the first thing I want to do is get in a little bit into the scent detection stuff, some of the basic concepts here. What a lot of peop people forget is that there's actually different kind of scent work. It depends what you're asking the dog to do, okay? First of all, there's pure detection. Usually, this is a stimulus versus the background. Okay, and background can be background noise. We use the word noise in psychophysics, as I mentioned yesterday, as meaning interference, everything else that is not actually the target that you're looking for. That's the most basic form. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that that's, you know, stimulus versus background. Then there's di discrimination. Technically, discrimination simply means discriminating between stimulus one versus stimulus two, okay? And it can get more complicated than this, and you can add a number of uh, 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 stimuli to uh, uh, discriminate. All right. Then there's identification. Now, this actually comes a little bit from human psychophysics, actually. You'll say, well, it's the same thing as discrimination. In some ways, it is. But with human tasks, usually in identification, it's often naming tasks, where you show a stimulus, and the subject or the participant has to say, it's this, or it's that, it's a cat, or it's a dog, okay? So in other words, you are really, in a way here, checking that there's an understanding, maybe more cognitive in some ways, from the animal or human, that, oh no, I know what this is. It is this individual, or that scent, okay? So there's a number of ways to do this, but as you will see later, matching tasks or matching to sample tasks are often the ones that will be used in that context. Then slightly different is the idea of scaling. That's actually hard to do in a way, but scaling has a lot to do with the quantity of the stimulus. How much of it is there? So I'll give you an example, which actually we mentioned in our book chapter, uh, in the Horowitz book, uh, is uh, we were asked a number of years ago, uh, although we've never done that project, um, it, it's, it's been uh, put on the back burner for a number of reasons, um, to help beekeepers uh, looking for varroa and nosema, which are uh, two of the internal and external parasites that seem to be a factor in the uh, beehive uh, 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 colony collapse, okay? But the idea is, is this, is that unfortunately when you talk to beekeepers, they will tell you this. Every beehive, at least in Nova Scotia and most of North America, is infected by nosema and varroa. It's, that's not the issue. We don't want a dog that will say, yeah, no, that's it. We want a dog that will be able to say, beyond this threshold, tell us that there's a problem. Below that threshold, it's still acceptable for us. So that's a kind of a discrimination on, on a gradient, if you want, that's really actually hard to train, okay? It takes a while to get there, especially if you have low saliency stimuli. Okay, then by far my favorite as an ethologist, as somebody working in the field looking for coyotes and wood turtles and, and, uh, and ribbon snakes is searching. But that's really hard to do because it's very dynamic. You're working with a dog in the field, it's tracking or trailing, and it's really hard to study, but we're slowly f finding ways to actually do this, especially with the current GPS technology, for instance, that will allow us to actually work a lot on this idea of reliability and validity, et cetera. But that's fascinating work, and this is where you see the dog really in its element, trying to really understand that world that we have no idea how it actually works. Uh, but that's, to me, the most fascinating part of it. Unfortunately, it's hard to do in lab conditions for obvious reasons. So sometimes you have to make compromises, and it's a real challenge to study, but that's why I'm really very much interested in it. So stay tuned, because hopefully we'll get do more and more in, of that in the future. So I just want to talk about the forensic applications here for a minute. First of all, uh, there's a lot of the work that you can do that is here lab-based, and a lot of us Kuhn and Hack are talking about in her book uh, on forensic canines is basically scent matching of subjects. So the idea, uh, uh, suspects, sorry, that are basically uh, uh, potential uh, 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 criminals. Uh, uh, and, and the idea is that sometimes they will have touched object or a piece of clothing, and for some reason you don't have fingerprints. 
so then the question is, can you actually match this object that was found on the crime scene to uh, the potential per 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 perpetrator? So that's essentially the idea. So that's one of the things I will discuss. And obviously there's the field part of this, which is uh, uh, police uh, departments using tracking and trailing dogs to actually find people that are uh, escaping uh, justice, for instance. Okay, so uh, usually this idea is that, again, you have an object that is often a weapon that may have belonged to the perpetrator. You want the dog to actually be able to match it with that uh, potential individual. And usually, historically, what people do here is a lineup. And that's interesting because you need to understand that it's historical why people adopted lineup in those conditions. It's because that's what we do with humans, okay? Uh, we'll put a lineup of six people and then we'll tell the, uh, the witness, do you recognize any of those individuals? And that is a big debate in cognitive psychology actually about how to do this. If it should be a photographic lineup, very sequential, or if you, you should look at all the individuals and then make your choice. Problem with this is often the individual will say they will pick up the person that looks the most like the perpetrator. Uh, there's all kinds of problems and it's back and forth in the literature. Just recently there was a paper actually that's re-questioning a lot of the ideas that we had about how to do this with humans. But one of the questions here is, is actually why would you do this? Because in this kind of work, the way I described with a dog, the dogs are actually not eyewitnesses. They're not trying to remember somebody they saw six months ago do something bad. So the lineup actually is intrinsically a mnemonic task, meaning that it's a memory task. But actually what we're asking the dogs to do in the, the, the kind of procedure I described to you is not based on memory as much as their ability to discriminate uh, between scent or actually pick up scent that are very similar. So that is a, a very uh, serious problem in cognitive psychology if you think that way. So before I go into more details, I'll explain later exactly why the lineup is not the right procedure to use. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention something about what people call, uh, call in forensic science the law of Fry. And this is actually uh, used by many countries and it's basically standards or principles used by juries. And it's the idea that juries, if you want your evidence to be accepted in court, will require a few things. For instance, is it verifiable? Uh, if, if it was tested, it was, it, was it actually peer reviewed and published? Uh, is there a known error rate? That's actually very important. And psychophysics can produce a lot of that information. Is the procedure standardized? And a lot of them are not. And is it generally accepted? And that's the idea that science likes to have consensus, obviously doesn't always work, although I have to say so far so good uh, for this conference, I think you've realized that we are keeping saying about all the same things. So that's good. So there is consensus in science often, <laughs> with exceptions. Okay, so um, uh, you know, one of the questions here obviously is, uh, are there some individual odors? Can you really distinguish individuals, uh, you know, you and you and you from each other? And we kind of know now that's actually really that's, that's that, that works, and there's all kinds of reasons why uh, wolves, raccoons, frogs, whatever, could actually do this. Theories in biology based on kin selection, for instance, these theory actually work mostly if there's kin recognition, and that means that indeed they can uh, discriminate between each other, between sex, uh, status of the immune system, status of the endocrine system, meaning hormones, all these kinds of things. So it makes sense that animals can actually do this, that they distinguish us not just by sight, but also by scent. So as long as you uh, agree with this, from the forensic dog perspective now, what you're thinking about probably is, uh, uh, what is there now is this idea that uh, it's almost like uh, for dogs, we have an olfactory fingerprint, okay? So we have our own odor signature, and that's why forensic canines in principle can do the work very well. Uh, so scent identification at that level, in that context, is basically biochemical fingerprinting. Uh, now, the methods, and this is where the problems start with people that actually do some of this uh, kind of training, is that you need actually some of these good practices that we just hinted at. Uh, first of all, double blinds and controls, like control conditions. Uh, very basic, and most of you know what I'm talking about. I won't get into the details here, but double blind, just to make sure, I need to explain what it is. And it's this idea that, especially in the maybe not super early stages of training, but certainly fairly quickly after you start training the animal, the handler and trainer can't possibly actually know what the dog 
is supposed to flag as a target. Why? Well, uh, James actually just talked about the Clever-Hans effect. That is certainly one of the reasons. And by the way, you don't have to cognitivize this. Uh, you just have to realize that they're just good at picking up on other cues. They're conditioned to something that is not the target, but other cues that they pick up on say, oh, those two things are associated. And there you go, they figure out what's going on, okay? Um, <clears throat> so um, there's other issues too that arise when you do this kind of work. Should you have single scent dogs? This is something that people ask me quite often. I don't think so. Some of our dogs are really specialized. My dog Zila, that unfortunately died recently, uh, was actually doing almost everything. She did coyote, she did uh, wood turtle, she, w she did uh, um, uh, ribbon snake, as you'll see later, you'll see pictures of her and a video of her working, uh, and many other things. Uh, and she was good at all of them, probably one of the most consistent also, including across some of those things I mentioned earlier, like detection, discrimination, identification, tracking, trailing, and all that, okay? But not, I agree, not all dogs can do all of this and, and be uh, good with all kinds of orders. Uh, age, well, she started at eight years old, and she died uh, recently at 15, and she was working still last year, and still one of her best dogs. So age matters, eh, ah, yeah. But you know, police forces and military that actually retire dogs at four or six years old, I think they're missing on, on so many years of good work, actually. There's no reason, especially if the dog still wants to work, why you should, you should actually reti retire them this, this early or this young. The training methods obviously can matter. Breed, well, we talked about that yesterday. I won't go back there, but you know what I think about this. And there's this issues also about what kind of uh, responses you can actually train, which, by the way, is a real problem with the forensic canines and a lot of the work, actually, that's been criticized by dog handlers and trainers here in the U.S., uh, in relation to some of their colleagues, is that sometimes they say, but what is the response? What's the alert? You don't know. And then the handler will say, well, I know my dog, I can read my dog. I know what they're saying, but in some cases, especially when you go in court, you want a dog that, that clearly gives a clear response. Yep, that's it, that's the one. No, 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 this, right here, right? But in some of the videos that you will see of done doing tracking, trailing, and forensic contacts, they walk around, I personally don't see the cues showing that they actually know what they're doing. But somehow the handler says they know. And that's where you get into these kinds of mysterious clever hunts like effect back and forth between the dog and the handler and the handler and the dog. It's, it goes both ways in strange ways, okay? And how you interpret, interpret those behavior is very important. And actually this is one of those real good cases where I will disagree with a lot of scientists that say that uh, the experimenter or the handler, whatever, should not be close to its subject. Mm -mm. If you really want to be good at this, you really need to know your dog, and your, the dog that works with you needs to really know you. So forget about all those cute principles that it should be you know, objective just because, no, no, no. In this case, you want that good relationship. You want to be able to read your dog, do, your dog read you, and it, that's how it's going to work well. Uh, the worst mistake you can do is give your dog to a new handler and say, go and figure it out by yourself because they will make up stuff, I guarantee you, both the dog and the handler. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Uh, we also need procedures that will get into what we call inter-dog confirmations, okay, comparing between dogs. We often work with two dogs in the field. If a dog flags something, we'll call the other dog and say, come, come, come check this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Or sometimes they disagree, which is quite interesting. And then we have to make a decision. Which one do we trust, right? Uh, intra dog confirmation as well in controls. I mean, they're not always consistent. They have bad days. Remember, you know, when I showed the tail earlier, it's just to make a comment that you need to read your dog that way too. Maybe, maybe uh, Fido doesn't want to work today. And, and you need to acknowledge this. There's no, uh, you waste your time you make it very aversive to the dog if you force them to work in conditions that, or uh, conditions, and I mean external conditions or their own condition, if they don't want to, if they don't feel good, if they, they, you know, if they skip breakfast, that's a bad sign, maybe, maybe it's not the time to work today. So if you do the lineups, for instance, there's a number of things that you can do with lineups, and I'll show you a lineup in a minute, but I think most of you know the principle is that you would have like, for instance, uh, stainless steel jars or glass jars with uh, foils and, uh, and a specific target in there. And um, 
uh, we call it zero runs in my lab, but it's this idea that essentially when you give a lineup to a dog, uh, you should have what we call a blank lineup. And this is a, com a, a very common mistake. And what I mean by this is you have to give them the opportunity to be able to go through a lineup, get at the end of the line and say, sorry, but there was nothing there. And a lot of trainers, uh, strangely, don't do this. And then you have a, a dog that's basically convinced that a lineup means there will be something there. So they get at the end of the lineup, they go like, oh, what happened here? I didn't find anything. So they go back and then they try, they, they'll flag something, they'll flag anything. So you have to give them the opportunity to say, no, sorry, there was nothing here. And make sure that they give a clear response of that as well. You would be surprised how many times that's not done. Uh, also, you need, you need to do what we call the two target lineup. It's a lineup where there's not just one target, but two, why? Because often the dogs will run the lineup, and uh, if, let's say, that the, 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 the stimulus, uh, the, the, the target is on position three, so the, the third jar, what they'll do is they'll go, oh, I'm done, okay, and then they disconnect from the rest of the lineup. The problem is there are three more jars there, and maybe if they had investigated them, they would have realized that the fifth one actually is the target or is closer to the target. So by giving sometimes, not all the time, two potential targets, you actually force the dog to go like, okay, I found this one, let's finish that lineup to see if there's more, okay? And, uh, and that, that is absolutely essential. And there's another thing that humans do that's very strange, is that you have to use a dice to do this, to do it really random. Because the problem is actually dogs will often run to the fifth of six uh, jars. And it's called the position five bias. Why? Because when humans think that they're being uh, random in their assignment of the target to a specific jar, they always tend to put it on average, not always, more often in position five than uh, the others. Not too early in the lineup, not right at the end, five sounds like a good you know, spot there. And there you go. And the dog gets in the room, they don't even sniff one, two, three, four, they go to five right away, they check it first like, oh, okay, it's not that one. <laughs> They're smart, aren't they? Amazing. Okay, um, now the, to go back to the forensic canines, there's a number of things also that are real problems, like when you have like a descent of perpetrators, the question of gender, race, yeah, race is actually interestingly a factor here, age, diet, uh, health conditions, all these things are actually more noise that's added to this. And there's a problem of saliency, and actually Catherine uh, later this afternoon will actually discuss this, which is really interesting, is this idea that when you train dogs to do this, to identify specific humans, the problem is that you're asking them to do something that you think is obvious, but is not why. Because all of their lives so far, they've been bombarded, completely uh, uh, over, um, uh, overtaken, uh, overflown by human scent. And they've basically kind of learned to ignore it. And now suddenly out of nowhere, you're telling them, no, 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 it's relevant. But you need to really help them understand this. Because at first they'll say, yeah, that smells like somebody, and that smells like somebody too, and that too, and what do you all need to find here? And they'll actually start looking for other things that have nothing to do with the odor of the person, actually. So, uh, and you'll see a great example of this with what Catherine will uh, talk about later. So the significance of this stimulus and the whole familiarity effect, again, that you have to tell them, no, 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 now I'm really telling you this is really important. It is important that you can distinguish between Peter, Johnny, and Michelle, okay? Uh, I will actually skip this. Uh, this is just more considerations about how damn complicated the whole thing is. Uh, again, you can read Schoon and Hack, actually, and they, they, uh, they, they talk a lot about these things. I'll just make a comment about the genetics of things when I said, actually, earlier that they match people quite well. There's actually uh, recent data showing that not just uh, fraternal twins, but also identical twins they can actually differentiate, which on, from a biological point of view, uh, that's actually quite surprising. And it was not always that studies said that, by the way. Uh, it, it was actually a question for quite a while is the uh, pink, uh, pink Spartas uh, study, actually, uh, uh, 2011, so relatively recent. Okay, now, dogs and handlers actually make mistakes. So uh, uh, James talked about the clever hands effect. I will get uh, that in a minute. That's the importance of actually doing double blind. Uh, the positional bias I already talked about. Uh, 
There's also the question of other cues that can be present, especially around the lineup, if you use the lineup. Hand washing, although you hear you have to be a little bit careful because that can also make things worse in some situations. There's a very interesting novelty effect, the odd man out effect sometimes uh, that they react to. Uh, but some people agree that maybe it's not such a factor. In fact, the other one is uh, more the question of familiarity that I just mentioned. And there's something really interesting that Schoon and Hawk discuss, which is rare preferences and dislikes. Sometimes you'll see dogs running a lineup with human scent, and they will literally consistently avoid a specific scent of a specific person. They will literally make a large detour around the vial. We don't really know why, but they just don't like it. Okay. So now we're, I'm going to discuss a little bit of data. I'll talk about lineup procedures and why they may not be the best tool. Matching to sample procedures. The saliency training is something that Catherine will talk about later. And uh, by the way, we use other techniques that I won't mention today, like habituation, dishabituation, although you have to be very careful with that one. We use uh, an adaptation or of errorless discrimination training. That's also in the, the Horowitz book. So I won't get uh, into those details now. So, a lineup, as I said earlier, is basically something that looks like this. This is a graphical representation. When you see S minus, this is just a stimulus you don't want them to flag. And the S plus that happens to be in bold there is the target. Like I said, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's none, just to make sure that they can actually uh, uh, figure out uh, that uh, it, it's not uh, always very predictable. So the way we do it actually is about if we have a session with 10 trials, uh, one trial will be a blank lineup, no target. One trial would be two, and uh, the, the rest of the trials, the other eight, uh, will have actually one, uh, one target. Um, and by the way, we adjust. Some dogs tend to really have a problem with signaling there's nothing in this lineup, in which case we will increase actually the number of blank lineups so they can really learn more quickly that, no, no, this is a relevant response. We want you to tell us. If you think there's nothing there, you have to tell us. So this is, a, by the way, very early training, okay? This is what we never do this in further steps. You will see here that the handler is really showing the dog what I want you, look at this, and then this, and then this. So don't worry, it's not done like that later. This is in early training, and later they can run the lineup by themselves. They don't have to be harnessed, leashed, or anything like this, and they will do it very systematically, okay? So this is early training. This is Pete. So, okay, now I need to explain something. You s just saw what, what she did there, it's a piece of paper. The sample, actually, in this case, is in a piece of paper. And there's a number of reasons why we tried to do this, because I said stainless, uh, stainless steel glass, uh, uh, sorry, stainless steel glass jars. Uh, we, we actually are experimenting with this for a number of reasons. Um, I won't get into those details now, but this is actually a procedure that has worked out uh, with us quite a while. So this is actually, this was uh, one of the setups that we used with six, uh, uh, with six items, uh, one being um, uh, the target. Okay, so basically, like I said earlier, the lineup tends to be the, the, the standard for the training of send dogs out there. And especially with forensic canines, I was telling you that it may not the, be the best way to go, simply because, again, they're not really uh, eyewitnesses. They are expert witnesses, but not eyewitnesses. So they're not relying on memory. In fact, they should not rely on memory, okay? It's not a memory task, it is a perceptual task, and that's where you need to change the procedure, and I'll explain why. So this is a little experiment that we did a number of years ago with two dogs, two of our quote-unquote expert dogs, and basically what we did is we looked at their performance rate, percentage correct, based on the position of the target in the lineup. And what's interesting here is what you're seeing is that when the target is in position one or two, or actually even three, they tend to be above 90% detection. But when you start having the target at position four, it goes down below, but it's still actually, in one case at least, in one of the two dogs here, a little bit above 80, okay? But then, by the time that you, when you have uh, targets at position five and six, their performance is really crappy. Now, why is this? So the way typically that you do it is that you will present the sample to the dog, say, snip this. Okay, now go find, okay? So now they have the, this stimulus that they just processed, and there's a memory component here because they go to one, then two, three, by four this time, they're like, wait a minute, what was that again? 
They've accumulated a lot of interference here. Like five? I don't remember. That's six? I don't know. So they're starting to guess more and more as they go. Another analogy is this. It's actually a research assistant of mine, uh, Jennifer Corning, that came up with this analogy. She uh, has a, had a lot of um, a fish at home and sometimes would actually transfer her fish from one tank to another. And you have to match when she would clean the, the, the aquaria, I guess, and she had to match the water temperature. So she would go and put her hand in this tank. Okay, is it the same temperature at this one? Yep, this one. And already she says, you know, by the, the time you're at the third tank, you don't really remember what exactly what the first one was like. So you see, that, that's kind of that mnemonic thing that you put there. You make it a memory task. And remember what I said, those dogs were not at the crime scene, right? They, they, they're not trying to remember what happened six months ago. You just want them to match directly. Is this, what I'm showing you now, in there? So it doesn't have to be a memory task. So, uh, and you, then you, you uh, remove that problem of uh, a degradation of performance as the lineup um, you know, gets longer. Okay, so the alternative way to do this is to make it simpler. To make, in a way, it's a shorter lineup. And it's to do a matching procedure with two, or we think, uh, based on our data, about three maximal, uh, maximum choice. Uh, so you reduce the working memory load here. This is a cognitive psychology term, which is this idea that when you work, when you do work, where you're in action, you are actually memorizing things. Okay, I just did that, now I have to do this, now I'm going to do this, now I have to do that, okay? But working memory is a fascinating thing to study, especially in what we call ergonomics, uh, because it, it's really a problem in some cases where, uh, you know, if, if you've ever been a bartender, for instance, you know that your working memory is working like crazy. Okay, you, what, what drink you want? This one, yeah, that one, blah, blah, blah. okay. You will get the drinks, you remember the change, all that working memory, big time, okay. But you see, especially early in training, this is very taxing on the cognitive system, on the brain. It's very demanding. So why do this if you can avoid it is, is essentially what I'm saying. And also you, you tend to create a longer delay between the presentation of the stimulus and you know, the, the potential target, especially if it's far down the, the, the lineup. You understand this? Yes? Is it clear? Okay, all right. So we came up with, uh, uh, and I think maybe Catherine will explain. No, actually, she doesn't, sorry. We came up with what we call the bucket procedure, and there's another reason for this, is that often people would say, well, how do you know that they're sniffing? By the way, this is often a problem. Uh, the, the Schoon and Huck group will actually tell you that sometimes when they have the sample uh, you know, in, in the, the jar and they present it to the dog, what they actually do is shove the nose of the dog in the jar to force them to take a, to take a breath. We don't want to do this. But a lot of the time, we present to them, and especially if they're starting to get bored, oh, okay, they won't sniff it. And the problem is, how can they pick up the right thing then if they don't sniff at first? So we, we're working on ways to actually make sure that they're actually sniffing the sample and then sniffing all of the, uh, of the other alternatives. So um, this is actually, so I'll come back to that in a minute. For some reason, I thought I had something else here. Okay, all right. Uh, this is actually one of the, the matching tasks that we had. Uh, we were not working with essential oils anymore because we had evidence that some dogs are very sensitive to them. We used to dilute them a lot, by the way. Uh, now we use uh, things like herbs, you know, tarragon, estragon, things like that, or tea, uh, green tea, whatever, and different dilutions of it. Uh, you will see this with Catherine, actually. And that, that's good enough for most of the work that we want to do. Here, they, uh, in this task, they were actually learning uh, eight different odors. So the sample that you present to them can be one of eight, and then they have to go and find a match, and all of the others, the foils, are actually at first nothing, then the same uh, distractor, and then all the five positions of foils will be different odors eventually. So you make the task harder and harder, and this is still a... But you see, with the lineup, it becomes actually difficult. So the two AFC task here, uh, at alternative force choice. This is from a few years ago. We don't do this setup anymore, and you will know why in a few minutes. This is Milo, we used to call him Einstein. So sample. Okay, tell me which one is the match. Okay, he kept his nose there for a few seconds. That actually got better with time. I asked the students to actually uh, get the dog to keep the nose on the sample for at least five seconds, so you count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, just to make sure that he's committed to that choice, essentially. 
But you will notice in a second, oh, and this dog responded very well to food reinforcement, no clicker, sorry. Uh, but it, it worked really well for him and there were other reasons why we did this. Um, you will see, I think, with Catherine, the clicker being used later. Okay, now, so he pokes, you know, when he's, he's pretty sure, but you will notice eventually he will actually make a mistake. And then what you'll realize, what we're doing, and I forget, maybe this is the one, or I may have missed it already. I think that's the wrong one. So then we, yeah, sorry, no. We make him wait just a tiny little bit and he goes like, oh, damn it, oh, I missed that, okay, all right. And then sometimes what we also do is that we'll show uh, uh, an absence of match. So that's not the one, I think it may be the next one. Oh, he got it wrong again. Oh, no, okay, I think. So, uh, uh, no, actually, I think it's the next one. So in my working memory is a little bit, um, I'm processing too many things at the same time. Okay, so this is actually, here what you just saw is he said, sorry, there was no match there, and he was actually right, okay. In other words, the sample was presented didn't have a match in the two alternatives that were, that were presented. Okay, so that's it for Milo. He seems to be doing what he's doing, you know, quite well. It goes on and on, all right? Just remember him. Whoops, what's not going forward? Okay, so uh, this is actually his data, and look at his performance over time. There's a few details here that we don't need to go uh, uh, get into, but, you know, he performed uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, around, if not above 90% pretty quickly. Um, there is actually a dip at one point, uh, and there was a new handler that day, <laughs> and that uh, threw him up. That's very common with dogs. So, you know, we, we thought this is great. It's fantastic. Looks, uh, looks fantastic. This is actually Rosalind. Rosalind took a lot longer to get there. But, you know, um, and more inconsistencies. She, she's much better now. She was quite a young Border Collie at the time, and she actually got better with time. Now, the thing is, this is a little bit more typical of what we would have actually expected. And, uh, oops, I'll go back for a second. So the problem is this, this cute little boy here. When that honor student left, Brittany, we had a, a break, and sometime in May, we started doing the work again. Uh, but she, she was done, and she's from Toronto, so left for Toronto. When we started running those trials again, he went back to chance a lot and consistently and he never really picked pick that up again. So then I kind of start talking to, uh, now what you don't see, by the way, you're thinking, well, this is not double blind, but what you're not seeing is Brittany sitting right there. Next to Brittany, behind a screen, there's a handler or somebody, uh, oh, sorry, an assistant that will give her the jars. And when the dog makes the, the right decision, normally what she should have been doing is say to Brittany, yeah, that was the right one, or we have a more subtle system than that that the dog can't pick up on, and then Brittany can give the, re the, the, the reinforcer. Now, the thing is, after drilling that research assistant uh, for a while, really insisting, she eventually told me, no, actually, it was not double blind, sorry. Brittany knew which one was the right stimulus. In other words, we think that Milo never really knew what he was doing, but picking up on something else. And I spent hours looking at those videos, trying to figure out what was the cue. We had another camera facing. I could see Brittany's face looking at, you know, as soon as I thought, oh, okay, it's the movement of the eye. The, then something else would happen. I said, okay, it's not that. You know, rewind the tapes. Let's start again. What is, you know, every part of her face. And we're not exactly sure. We think it may be actually the way she was pushing back when he was actually giving it his answer. So now we don't use this procedure anymore for that reason. And I insist that the students tell me, did you do this double blind at least later in training? I, you know, initially it may be faster and easier not to do so, but you can't wait too long before you start having problems and the dog is learning the wrong things essentially. So that's a great example of a, a potential clever hands effect. So another way to do this, especially if you want to show how well our good dogs at uh, doing this in terms of uh, of their detection capabilities, we use matrices like this, uh, three by three, four by four, or five by five, where again, you have the target among many different distractors. And at first, we train them on an open matrix where they actually just scan like this, and when they find the right jar, they'll put their nose on it and stay for five seconds. And that's their way of saying it's like pointing. That's the right one. 
And then when they, they're okay with this, what we do is we put a hood on top of it. And now it becomes a real detection task where we can use signal detection theory, if some of you know what it is. And what they'll do is that they'll come in the room, sniff over uh, the whole of the, the, the funnel, basically, and then they just have to say if the scent is there or not. And obviously, the larger the matrix becomes, the harder it is because there's more and more interference. And what's interesting is it depends on the stimuli we use, obviously. But matrix, uh, the, the, the three by three and the four by four, they're doing okay. With the five by five, with most stimuli we use, it starts to get really, really, really difficult. And probably not really representative of what they experience in the field, unfortunately. Now, the bucket procedure uh, is an interesting one because here what you'll see is we tell the dog to uh, pick up the sample. Okay, can I stop this? No, yeah, okay, let me, sorry. So I'll explain it, uh, I'll mimic it for you. So um, the, the, now the sample is a bucket too, or a container, and there's like three crumbled pieces of paper, you've noticed, right? And that's why we use paper, it's just easier for them to pick it up. So to verify that they're actually sniffing the sample, in that container, there's like, two crumbled pieces of paper that have nothing on them, and one that has the, the sample or the, the potential match. So they have to go there, and they have to pick the one that has the scent, and that's our way to know that, okay, they're really sniffing it, they know that's the one, okay? And then they go to the buckets. Okay, so again, okay, that's, they could, okay, that's the one. That's the smell I'm going to look for. Now I'm going, I'm looking in this bucket, no, it's not there, I'm looking in this bucket, and then uh, if within that bucket, they pick the target. So this is our way to verify that perceptually they really understand what's going on, okay? So the two buckets, first of all, which one has the odor? But then when they, they, they choose the right bucket, we, we, we ask a little bit more of them. It's like, okay, you know it's in there, good, but now tell us exactly which of those pieces of paper has the scent. And that's a great way to verify that they really, quote unquote, know what they're doing. So um, usually, actually, the dogs did quite well. Oh, actually, sorry, this is a, uh, I made a mistake here. I did last minute changes on this, and clearly the sequence is not right. I uh, apologize for this. Uh, but actually, this is the, the matrix data. Uh, and actually, basically, it, what it's showing is that the, the, uh, uh, the performance uh, with the size of the matrix, as you see, uh, uh, it, it, a lot more difficulty with the larger uh, matrices. Uh, I don't actually have uh, right now um, data on this. We're working on it, it's in progress. Uh, with the kind of work, specialized work that we do, it takes a long time to get uh, data from unfortunately very few dogs, uh, but it's, it's uh, coming very nicely, so we have uh, high hopes for this. Uh, I will skip this because this is a little bit technical. Um, and I'll just say this, and it's not really the conclusion of my talk because I'm getting into something else in a minute. Uh, we know that dogs actually can do this but we can do it better, and uh, let's do it. In other words, you and us scientists can work together on this to do real good scent work training and uh, you know, uh, also train good handlers that will do it the right way with all the right control conditions. And uh, because otherwise, if we don't do this, uh, it, it's ruining this, ruining this industry it, and it's, it gives bad rap to you, to us, and to the dogs and actually there's no reason why we can't fix this. So I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, olfactory system. Now I said I was not going to do uh, the neuroscience hat that much, but like uh, I can't help myself. Uh, so <clears throat> just very quickly, I'll just say, look, uh, first of all, they have a big nasal cavity there. They, they just have the, you know, the, they have the hardware for it. Although I did say yesterday, remember that it, hardware is not everything, okay? The software part is important as well. This is where the dopamine breeds, as I call them, come into the fold in the sense that uh, they, they have the, the right neurotransmission going on, basically. Dopamine being an extremely important neurotransmitter in the olfactory bulb and the olfactory system in general. So uh, are breeds better than others? Sure. Now this is us humans. By the way, we tend to say we're bad at this. Well, you know, I mean, we have a fairly good system. It's not that bad. It's, it's a little bit smaller. It's not as big, it's, you know, but it, it, it works. Except that, you know, it's at the software level again, in terms of how our olfactory system works, that, you know, dogs are far superior than we are. We are, after all, microsmatic as opposed to macrosmatic. Um, 
Now, a little note, and I think it's uh, Ray, Ray Coppinger actually uh, touched on this earlier. There's actually two olfactory systems in most mammals, in fact, in most vertebrates. One is what we call the main or primary olfactory cortex, and that's the one that uh, it tends to process most odors, neutral odors, but some significant biological odors as well. And then we have the accessory or secondary olfactory cortex, which is basically the vomeronasal organ that, uh, or complex that Ray was mentioning that is also called the Jacobson's organ. And that's the one that's usually associated with processing pheromones. In other words, uh, smells that usually have their source uh, from uh, uh, hormones, okay, that are secreted. Um, but just make it out of the body through sweat, for instance, uh, breath, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that system, interestingly, is like the other one, connected also to uh, the, uh, the um, uh, domain uh, processing system, including the limbic system. What we actually don't really know is how they complement each other. And most of the time, we assume that dogs work with the first one, not so much with the second one, with most of the tasks that we do, although, uh, uh, for, again, for what we do, I mean, obviously, if, if, if a male is looking for a female, it's going to be the, the second one, the VNO, that will be activated. Uh, but actually, it, it's not really clear that they're not kind of working with each other and complementing each other. We have a dog, for instance, once, that started giving that Fleming response that actually uh, Ray was uh, uh, mentioning. Cats will do this. You know, uh, bringing the molecules right to the, the opening uh, of the palate that, by, that you can actually touch, by the way. Uh, you put your, your finger inside the, the, the mouth of your dog, you'll find a little bump right here. That's, that's the opening uh, that I will describe actually in a minute. Um, and, uh, but she started doing this, uh, my dog Zila, like, like this, and she was drooling and everything. And what was interesting is the only time she ever did that, and she got on more like, hunting mode is the only time that we had to actually restrain her away from that snake. But we realized when we caught the snake, it was actually bleeding. It had already been injured. So interestingly, that activated the VNO system. So they can work together sometimes. And there's good evidence with other models, like hamsters, for instance, that actually they are often uh, not as separate from each other as we think. Some species can uh, process uh, pheromones actually with the primary olfactory system, and humans are a great example of this. Mechling talk effect. We do have a VNO, by the way. Uh, you can see with neuroimaging, the only thing is it's not connected to the brain or to the olfactory system, so it's kind of useless. Okay, uh, I'll skip this one. And uh, that, that duct or opening that I was talking about inside the mouth that Ray actually showed from a skeletal perspective, it's this right here, okay? Uh, that's from, a, actually, that's a rat, not, uh, not uh, so uh, I will skip this, uh, and this is your uh, primary olfactory system. There's a lot more in the Horowitz uh, book. I'm really running out of time here, sorry. This is the first one. I'm really misjudged time, clearly. Uh, if you want to read more about this, you're welcome to look uh, at that uh, book chapter. It's a relatively complex system, actually, uh, but it's, it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, I talked about this yesterday, the difference between smelling and sniffing, just something to keep in mind. I will skip this as well. I will skip this, sorry. Okay, in, uh, in the book, one of the, thing that, uh, one, one of the things that we do is that we distinguish actually between the what and the where system. And it's a, an interesting idea that actually come from, came from people in neuroscience and uh, uh, psychophysics perception as well, uh, arguing that actually in the visual system, uh, there is a, a two components, one which is really focused on identifying what is this stimulus, and the other one which is really based on where is it. So there's a grizzly bear, oh, it's a grizzly bear, but now where is it in comparison, to, should I run, should I, what, okay. So a uh, very clear adaptation, basically, of, you know, uh, uh, in the brain to respond to uh, potentially threatening stimuli. And basically, you can see that a lot of the tasks that I described earlier will fit within what uh, uh, Catherine and I described as the what and where system, and potentially how much as well, although that may be related to where, which is the question of scaling. So very quickly here, I'm going to show you one of our most successful program, which ran out of funding because of our government. Let's be political for a second. Hopefully they listen, and they will do something about this. Uh, so please, uh, Mr. Harper. Um, Remember that conservation in the environment is important. Okay, uh, so we do a lot of uh, reptile research with ribbon snakes, wood turtles. I'm interested in reptiles uh, for the sake of reptiles myself, anyway. I won't get into that, but anyway. 
Um, and uh, the dogs have been fantastic here. We've used them as a great outreach uh, tool as well. And what I mean by this is that, interestingly, uh, sometimes the kids are not really interested in the reptiles per se, but they love seeing the dogs doing the work. And then they get into the reptiles after. So it's great to work uh, in those uh, kind of um, uh, context. And it helps us with a lot of different things uh, with that kind of field work. And I will probably have to come back to talk about some of that stuff later. This is a ribbon snake. Uh, this is the kind of env environment we work in. So the grass gets really, really high, and you can't really see where they are, and they're very well camouflaged, and there's water. A lot of people at DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, actually told us there's no way dogs can actually do this in this kind of environment. It's marshy, there's a lot of smells that can interfere with the olfactory system. Like, and like I said, actually, again, it, one of our most successful programs, they did fantastic. That's, again, a little bit more of the environment. This was a day here where there was actually a lot of flooding going on, so they were literally tracking in water and doing quite well. You see a ribbon snake on top there. There's a, this is my dog, Zila, just behind. Oh, by the way, you see a choke collar there. Don't panic. It was not used as a choke collar. This just, okay, all right. In fact, I don't even know why she had that around. Was, uh, but anyway. So uh, there's a ribbon snake there. Can you see it? Oh, you are, you're good. Uh, well, anyway, she doesn't see it yet, but she's tracking it. So that's, you know, when I was saying earlier, we have a great research team. Uh, we combined two, and it's right there. I don't know if you see the bands. So you see that camouflage is remarkable, especially when, thank you, I'm out of time, when the, you know, the, the grass is really long, it's really, really hard to see. This is actually more of the environment, two of my former students. Uh, this is actually Zila actually looking uh, for one of those snakes that went and uh, uh, hide under the, uh, those stumps. And I believe, hopefully this is going to work. Okay, so this is her actually looking for it, and you'll see here she's struggling a little bit. We are there, we're not seeing anything, but clearly she's onto something, and she's starting to do these kind of concentric circles here. And look at the tail. So that, because I know my dog, I can tell you that I knew, I knew she was on it. Plus the sniffing rate was really strong, you could hear it. And the tail, like, that means, yeah, I know, it's here. It's, I know, I know, Let it, give me a second, I'll find it, I'll find it, I'll find it, I'll find it, I guarantee. And she's doing this for a while, and then unfortunately, whoever was filming this, I forget, uh, stopped the camera just as somebody said, snake. Uh, and then, so you don't actually see the snake, but trust me, she actually found it. It took a little while. It was a tiny little thing, about this big and about thin like a pen pencil. It was really hard to see, but she, she totally found it. Okay, I'll just skip this. You get the idea anyway. They can do this in those kinds of conditions. Uh, by the way, the harness and the leash, this is because Parks Canada, which is our e equivalent of Park Service, uh, uh, what do you call it here? Park Service? Yeah, uh, required uh, the dogs to be leashed so they don't uh, start apparently, uh, you know, uh, chasing wildlife and slaughtering them. <laughs> this is my English Shepherd uh, 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 dog, Flynn, uh, having a, a stare context, a contest with a wood turtle that he just found very proud of himself. It was his first, actually. That was its very important picture for us. And they uh, are very good at finding also the tiny little wood turtles. They're about the size of a toonie. Oh, God, you don't know what this is. A toonie is our $2 piece. It's metal, right? So, so it's about this big. Uh, but you can see the size anyway. And when you, you look for this in the woods, among leaves and, and rocks, and everything, it's impossible to see. But the dogs are fantastic at finding those little babies. And that's Zila actually sniffing it. They, they love sniffing it. They can go there for five minutes, 10 minutes. We don't know what is it that they turns them on that much about the baby wood turtles, but they just love them. And that was a great day with Zila and Flynn and, and the team. And you can see most of the students there actually have turtles in their hands. Uh, we, that day, actually, we couldn't keep up. The dogs were finding them like this, and we were processing them at the same time, taking measurements and everything, and we had turtles all around us. <laughs> just fantastic. So. Um, can I take a f one more minute, two minutes? Like, or, you, no, is that, okay. So I apologize if I go over time. Okay, now this is the thing. Um, are dogs the best tool for scent work? Now you're going to start hating me. Wah, wah, wah. Not necessarily. And what made me realize this is working actually with some agencies that really got excited about some of these projects. And then when they ask us how much this is going to cost, you give them you know, a price, and we don't charge much because I don't have to pay my students. Uh, you know, it's, that's the way it works, unfortunately. 
Um, so I don't pay a trainer, and, but you know, um, they don't even like the amount I give them, which is just based for equipment, commuting costs, and these kinds of very basic things. But the thing is, sniffer dogs cost anything, as you know, between five and $50,000, depending on what you're asking them to do. And uh, when you actually tell people these kinds of things, they say, oh, no, this is way too expensive. And um, for cancer detection, the same thing is, you know, if they're so good at it, why is it that they've not been implemented somewhere in Canada, in the US, or Europe? And they haven't yet. Tons of studies showing how good they are at doing this. So we have to convince what? The, or who? The FDA? Health Canada? What, what are the problems here? No, but again, it's, it's the time. It takes three, six, nine months, sometimes more, to train some of the dogs to do some of that specialized work. Um, and the market value, like I said, is, uh, I said $5,000, uh, $5, actually, that's us. That's not a lot of money. But really, I mean, the, in the real dog market went by, done by trainers, it's anything between fifteen and $50,000. Um, and there's another problem with dogs. It's all the stuff we've been talking about, you know, the last few days. They have intelligence, affect, sentience, personality. And that sometimes gets in the way. So the thing is this, is that if you are looking for a mobile unit, as I said earlier, if you're doing tracking and trailing, fantastic. You'll never use anything better than a dog. And again, like many people will tell you this. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have read Robert Lubo's, Lubo's book, uh, War Animals, which is actually kind of really uh, hard to read, but he makes great points of the use of animals, including tracking dogs, actually as being great, uh, very efficient kind of systems. Uh, and they've tried many other species uh, in Israel and the US here, and they always come back to the dogs anyway. So one of the issue, again, is the deployment issues. Um, I have colleagues that are interested in doing work with the Emerald Ash Borer, and recently they realized that people from the USDA and some state departments are actually saying, okay, good. Uh, but when those companies are saying, okay, fine, but one dog is $35,000, they go like, oh, but we need like four of those just for the state of Minnesota, for instance. And then they start say, saying that maybe this is too much. So one solution is to do remote scenting, where you sample things in the field, including those trees infected with, potentially infected with uh, some of those parasites or those insects, and then bring those samples to the lab and ask the dogs then to do the, the, the detection or discrimination or identification in the lab. Uh, and if it's well documented, then you can say, you know, sample number, da, 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 that tree, yeah, infected, go cut it and destroy it kind of thing. Uh, and that would be less costly. So this is one of the things that we're experimenting with now is that uh, remote scenting, which actually came directly from people working with uh, demining dogs in Europe. And, uh, but again, the question is, well, if it is so costly, if it takes so long, why use dogs? And I will finish, sorry, uh, very quickly by saying that actually there's a number of groups out there that have used other systems. You may have heard of the bees doing explosive detections or using, doing cancer detection. You think, uh, what, bees? Well, here the thing is that you don't actually work with operant instrumental conditioning, you actually work with classical conditioning. And uh, there's a number of projects, including here in, U in the US, that have used wasps, for instance. Fruit flies more recently actually were used. So patients with lung cancer or potentially having lung cancer can blow, for instance, in one of those uh, kind of weird vials there that they, they use, weird system. And if there's actually volatiles associated with cancer, and they were trained on these odors before, then the insects will aggregate in a very specific part of that system, and that's the way to know that something is going on. And there are other invertebrate models that actually we are uh, looking into because, and I will skip this unfortunately because of lack of time, it's uh, showing, uh, you should look at this on, um, on uh, YouTube, it's the, the Incentinel group in, uh, in, um, in the UK, um, uh, the, the study at the bottom there by Rains that have trained bees to do explosive detection. It's really impressive to see how quickly they learn just by associating the food with uh, the, the explosive, basically. And they have what we call the proboscis response, which is how they extend the proboscis, what they eat with, uh, when they actually uh, smell the explosive because they've associated with the food before. Uh, and insects, uh, uh, there's problems with insects. It's a question of handling, especially bees or wasps. It's weird that we go with those models. Husbandry issues, because now you need a hive system and everything. And the problem, too, is longevity. Most insects live at adult stage, what, about three months, and that's it. 
So you constantly have to train those animals. Now again, the thing is, if you look at those videos, you'll see that actually it takes about five minutes to train those animals with classical conditioning, which is quite remarkable. So um, what we are planning to do basically is to look at another invertebrate model, but I won't tell you what it is. And maybe in the future, uh, I'll have a chance to talk to you about it. Thank you very much.